welcome to this final video on the nerve supply of the lower limb. Now if you watched the previous videos, you hopefully know your dermatome from your myotomes, and you have your peripheral nerves locked down. In this final video, I'm going to take that knowledge we've looked at, and apply it to some clinical situations, looking at how damage to these structures could prevent in a patient. First, let's imagine a patient with a severed peripheral nerve, uh, for example the femoral nerve. How could this prevent? Well, to understand that, you need to ask yourself three important questions. First, what structures did this nerve supply? In this case, the femoral nerve supplied muscles in the anterior compartment and skin over the anterior thigh and medial leg. Next, what function do these structures have? As a group, the muscles in the anterior thigh will flex the hip and extend the knee. If the nerve is severed, then these movements will be compromised and potentially lost, unless there are other muscles that can produce these movements. So, are there other muscles that can perform these movements? Well, so is major is also a flexor of the hip, and since it isn't innervated by the femoral nerve, should be unaffected. This means that flexion may be weakened, but shouldn't be lost. Extension of the knee is a different matter. Only quadriceps can produce this action, so loss of the femoral nerve will result in a complete loss of this movement. Similarly, the cutaneous innervation of the peripheral nerve is fairly discreet, so it's unlikely that another peripheral nerve will provide sensation to these areas. So, if the femoral nerve is severed, we'd expect to see weakened hip flexion, absent knee extension, and a loss of sensation over the anterior thigh and medial leg. Now, that scenario assumed that the entire nerve had been severed. In reality, nerve may be damaged at any point along their course, and the location of that damage will affect which symptoms the patient has. Now, an important rule to remember is that the symptoms of nerve damage will always be distal to the location of that damage. Why is this? Well, normally nerves provide a route for motor signals to travel out from the brain, and sensory signals to return back. If a nerve gets damaged, then motor signals are unable to travel beyond the injury. This means any muscle distal to that point won't receive innervation. Similarly, areas of skin beyond the injury will be unable to send sensory information back to the brain. Therefore, these areas will experience a loss of sensation. By way of example, let's imagine the tibial nerve has been damaged. This nerve leaves the spinal cord and travels down the posterior thigh as part of the sciatic. At this point, it gives off muscular branches to the hamstrings before continuing into the posterior leg, where it supplies all of the muscles in this compartment, passes under the ankle, and then supplies muscles and skin in the foot. If the whole nerve was damaged, we'd lose motor supply to all of these structures. But what if it was damaged here, at the level of the knee? Well, only structure distal to the injury would be affected. So we'd lose motor supply to the posterior leg and muscles of the foot, as well as sensation over the sole of the foot. However, since the motor supply to the hamstrings is proximal to the injury, motor signal from the brain can still reach these muscles, and they should work as normal. If the tibial nerve was damaged at the ankle, then structures in the foot would still be compromised, but now muscles in the posterior leg would be fine. Understanding the motor and sensory supply of the peripheral nerve will help you to understand which nerve has been damaged. But if you can learn how it supplies those structures, and the order it does it in, you'll be able to establish where that nerve has been injured. What about our nerve root? Well, if a nerve root gets damaged, you generally expect both its dermatome and its myotome to be affected. For example, if L4 was damaged, we'd have altered or lost sensation across the medial aspect of the leg. We'd also expect to see weakness in extension of the hip, knee, and ankle. Remember, if the pattern of dermatome and myotome loss doesn't match up, then it's not likely to be a nerve root injury. Finally, I'd like to look again at the relationship between nerve roots and peripheral nerves. In this table, we've got the major peripheral nerves as well as the nerve roots that supply them. I said earlier that nerve roots tend to supply multiple peripheral nerves, and so if a single nerve root gets damaged, then all of the peripheral nerves it supplies will be affected. 
For example, if L4 gets damaged, we can see that the femoral, sciatic, tibial and superior gluteal nerve would all be compromised. However, none of these nerves are exclusively supplied by L4. So, although the nerve root injury will affect all of these nerves, none of them should stop working completely. This gives us a good general rule of nerve root injuries, that they often result in partial loss of function in multiple peripheral nerves, and by extension, across multiple compartments. So if you meet a patient with muscle weakness in several compartments, there's a good chance they suffered a nerve root injury. And so, that's it. Everything I wanted to cover about the nerve supply to the lower limb. Hopefully this has helped you make sense of this topic, but if you have any questions, please just get in touch. I'm hoping to make a lot more videos this summer, so if there are any topics you'd like me to look at, again, please just get in touch. And if you'd like to know when those are up, then please consider subscribing. Other than that, thank you for watching, take care, and I'll hopefully see you soon. Cheers.